Mark, you are now, the, you know, you've got this fantastic show on at the Met at the moment, wonderful reviews, you know, you were at the top of your game, so to speak, Emmy Award winning. How did you first come from the stage into opera? I was a violinist uh, in my childhood and youth. I actually went to a uh, university on a violin scholarship, so music was always a big part of my life. And I had always loved the sound of opera since I was a kid, but I hadn't really seen that much. I, I saw a few free performances at the Lyric Opera in Chicago where I grew up, um, but never really experienced that much opera until I became an adult. And then it was one of those things where somebody just said, do you think you could do an opera? And I, when I was directing for a few years, and I said, absolutely, I know I can do it, I know I can do it. And so that's how it started. The first one was um, at San Francisco Opera in their uh, program that is no longer there for new work. But it was a new opera by John Harbison. And then I later did his Great Gatsby at the Met. So that sort of was an interesting you know, uh, seed that was planted. And then I went right to Santa Fe and St. Louis and did um, in Santa Fe Arabella Strauss and in St. Louis Don Giovanni. So it was a huge leap. And then um, more new work by Dominic Argento came after that. And that also brought me to uh, Scandinavia for the first time uh, at uh, Gothenburg. And was that all, that was opera? Because I know you directed theatre in, in no, Sweden as well. No, actually only only opera at, mm, at, only at, opera. at, the, at the Gothenburg House. And it was, it was uh, the Voyage of Edgar Allan Poe, Poes Sisteriesa, or something like that in Swedish. <laughs> but you've also, you know, movement, choreography is very much part of what you do, which yeah. is not always the case. I mean, very often, there's so much in opera of people standing on a stage singing. But that whole thing with movement has always been very, very important to what you do. Mm -hmm. Has that been, I mean, where did that come from? Has that always been? I think really that came from when I was an actor. I spent a lot of time at the Guthrie Theatre under Michael Langham, a really wonderful director, who had been the protege of Tyrone Guthrie. and. Michael, in his turn, uh, mentored me as I began directing big Shakespeare works. But first I was a member of the company, and I was amazed to feel myself a part of a sort of beautifully choreographed, choreographed organism on the, on the Guthrie stage, which had been designed by Tani Moisevich after they did the Stratford, Ontario stage. So it, it gave itself to a great deal of fluidity and movement on the part of the actors. In fact, on a thrust stage, you have to move. So working on a thrust stage as an actor taught me that you can move and make a point with a whole body. And uh, uh, though I love working on proscenium, where you don't move as much, still movement has always been a kind of organic part of what I what I do and what I like when I'm watching when I'm watching theater and especially when I'm watching opera, which can suffer from stasis. How do you? get singers to move. I mean, you know, singers learn to sing. They don't necessarily learn to act. How right. do you... So you say you're faced with a diva, you know, who doesn't move. Where do you start? I try to encourage her to, uh, you know, feel easy about herself um, and to... Can you, can you express any of what you're singing in your, in your body? Um, can you... I sort of coax them a little bit. Or, uh, or I demonstrate very often and, and then ask, you know, do you think you might be able to do that? Do you think you might be able to do this? And, and if you can tie bribery, it, of course. it's a little bit of bribery, but if you can tie it to the music for them and let the music's objective match the objective of the moment that the character is in, often you can, you can really make it happen. It's very tough though, I mean, because what singing requires is a certain way of holding your body. And it isn't always the most beautiful way of holding your body because your diaphragm is your, is your, you know, is your diapason, it's the organ. And so when you're doing an opera, say, like Butterfly, where she's a geisha, essentially, she's a 16-year-old geisha, I think, in the first act, um, you, it's very interesting to watch sopranos try to do the movement that the, there's always a Japanese movement coach, you know, and it's fascinating to watch them try to, to do what they can to give this impression. And then we just pick and choose a few things that will do it enough for the audience to, to sort of believe that she's a little girl, or she's also a Japanese little girl. When you 
work, when you work, work with us, both of these operas, you did um, Les Toiles, you know, which was a hoot and was a real turning point for this company. Um, and now Golden Cockerel, these are both comedies, but obviously you work with tragedy as well. Is there a, a direct line? I mean, or do you, it's, you know, you so often with, well, in a way with Golden Cockerel, it's also a tragedy. Mm. There's that, you're on that sort of pivot between tragedy and comedy. How, how, how do you deal with that? It's tough. It's a challenge in this, in Golden Cockerel, uh, because uh, I'm still finding my way into the strangeness of the piece. The, 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 it's a beautiful strangeness, and some of it is meant to be uh, deeply surreal and dreamlike, and then some of it is almost a kind of vaudeville comedy. And then, um, and then there's this, this mysterious woman who seems to be pulling the strings, and yet, just as you think she's manipulating the whole opera, she too has these very vulnerable moments. Um, and it's going to be interesting to find, as we as we pull it together, how much how much true comedy there is. There's a there's a pirate recording of Beverly Sills recording uh, of Beverly Sills performance with Norman Trigel, Trigel at New York City Opera, which I listened to long after we had. Uh, worked on this, George Siglitis, the, des the designer, and I, from a Romanian recording. And that's done in English. It's called Coq d'Or. It was a big success for her, just as she was really launched. And um, it's all played like a Broadway musical comedy. In hearing it, you kind of think, well, there are certain values of the piece that have gone right down the drain. But you hear laughter from the audience with all kinds of stuff that she must be doing. Um, she was a great comedian anyway, as, as well as a great singer in her, in her prime. This version that we're doing, I'm not camping it up. I'm not camping it up that much. Andrew Shore, who plays the, the leading role of the czar, the ridiculous czar, um, has done the role before and has both the sort of tragic and the comic going. The, the basic... Uh, the basic idea inside the opera is one of yin and yang, the masculine uh, energy that thinks it needs force and violence to get anything done, the feminine energy that she embodies, which is uh, all about transformation and shape-shifting and, uh, and beauty. and. That is what conquers. That's what wins at the end. The men are all dead. <laughs> My goodness, so they are. Mm -hmm. You have a rehearsal to go to. I do. <laughs> which they are probably all waiting. We have dancing slave girls today. We have dancing soldiers. We have a dancing queen, a dancing king. So it's a big dance day. <laughs> a big dance day. And, and you have a, a very remarkable little boy playing the golden cockerel. Oh, he's wonderful. So That's before good, he yeah. pecks you to death, you'd better get down there. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. <laughs>